outside a little bit of a hurry up. That'd be amazing. Uh, just for those, just reminding everyone about the program has been brought forward. So we should be done and dusted from here at around about 10 past three this afternoon. Rachel, Rachel Tolele. Uh, unfortunately, she's had uh, sickness within the whanau, so won't be with us uh, after lunch, which means we've brought the whole program forward. Also, in the app, apparently there's a bit of a mistake about what's coming up in this next session. So just to reiterate, uh, we're going to hear from Tom Irvine now. And then there will be a panel discussion which is being facilitated and led by Raylene. So those are the two uh, sessions that are coming up before lunchtime. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Tom Irvine, CEO Ngāti Whātua Ōrāke Whaimaia. Tom is Tumu Whakarai, or CEO of Ngāti Whātua Ōrāke Whaimaia. Whaimaia is the, tri uh, the tribal development arm of the Tāmaki Makaurau-based hapū that supports whānau and local communities with a broad range of social, cultural and environmental programmes and services. Prior to this, Tom was Deputy Director of the Auckland Art Gallery, Toi o Tāmaki, responsible for all aspects of operations and stakeholder engagement. During his career, Tom has worked at senior executive level in a number of commercial enterprises, led international sales teams, overseen process improvement and provided stewardship to client and key stakeholder relationships. His work has seen him travel the globe extensively while maintaining his roots firmly here in Aotearoa. As a respected Māori leader with strong iwi and civic engagement experience, Tom has a deep love for Tāmaki Makaurau and its people and is a proud papa and koro. Please welcome to the stage Tom Irvine. Tēnei au ko te uri o manu manu ko te aitanga atiki. He matakahi he manu ka he kahi ka yahu mai te kohanga tapu tapu atea. I te whare o te manu ka, i te whare kuro o manu ka pua. Tēnei o te hoatu nei hoka e awai, whana e āringa hiko i a te whetu, hiko i a te marama, kei te whae au, kei te au marama e. E te whare, au te, te pōkapu, te whare ki runga, ki te awa, te wai o horutu, e te whare, tū mai, tū mai, tū mai atu rā. Me mihi au ki ngā mate o te tātou tini marae. Nō reira i ngā mate, ko koutou tēnei, kua hoko hoko i te pai. Kua koro ki ki runga ki ngā tautura teitea to ānui a tāne, haere ngā mate. Haere i mua i te tirohanga a ngā iwi. Kua maho e i hona i a koutou ki te ao tūroa, haere ki manawa kore. E ki ai te kōrero, hiko i a te whetū, hiko i a te marama, kārere, kārere, ko te atu i whaea. Haere ngā mate. Ka huri au ki te honga ora. E te rangatira Raylene, tēnā koe. E au ki rangatira o te kaupapa ihi Aotearoa, tēnā koutou. Koutou kua tai mai nei. Haere mai ki te whenua rangatira o Ngāti Whātua Rākei, te kahu tōpuni o Tūpereri. Tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Kei te mihi hoki ki a tātou, ki te kaupapa i tēnei wā, Pikiaki, te hauora, pikiaki te wairua, pikiaki te mana, o nga tangata katoa. Kei te tua hau kei konei hei tautoko ki ngā kaupapa. Ka ki mai koe ki au, i aha te mea nui o te ao, mā koe ki a tū, he tangata, he takiwa, he kaupapa. He tangata, he takiwa, he kaupapa. Nō reire e te whare, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Uh, kia ora mai tātou katoa. Kia ora everyone, I'm Tom. And uh, I'm not one of the songbirds of my whānau, of my iwi, so I'll uh, not put you through a solo uh, rendition of a couple of the Māori songs I do know. I will, though, tell you a story soon, and I'll show a video, uh, a story I think you'll love. But first of all, every good kaupapa, Ngāti Whātua, a great kaupapa for our family, for our people, for Aotearoa, for Tāmaki, Needs a vision, a mission statement. So ours is, ki arere arorangi te kahu pōkere ki ngā tautara, 
Atomata, tike tike, to fly and soar to the highest heavens. Simple, eh? So that's, that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed as a Niwi. Uh, you might have seen from my, or heard from my um, introduction. I'm not a finance person. That person's on holiday. Renata Blair was meant to be up here instead of me. Uh, I'm the sub, and uh, thank you for my uh, cousin Maka Royal over there who uh, asked me to do that in his place. So, not a finance person, don't really know about numbers, I'm an electrician and an optimist. So my story will be about a story about our whānau, our family and the Māori economy and then potentially at the end have some synergies with the kaupapa of, or the sector, sport and recreation. Just got to find my clicker. Can I leave you for a few minutes? This is my uh, waiata tautoko. It's a story, wow, a story, a video, a true story of aitua, of tragedy, of manawaroa, resilience, and more importantly, of resurgence and hope. Fairawa me fai maya. So take a listen to this. I try not to cry while it's on. When they start to burn the two houses like I was in the centre of it, I knew it was my turn coming next. So, I stayed there on the last day when they started to dismantle the place. Of course, my wife and children started to cry. So I thought, well, I'd have to give into this. So I made up my mind to move to get him off. I stood up against the might of the crown. And we're not big men, but let them come and try and evict us off here. We'll have so many people on Bastion Point. We want that flag to fly. We want this house to stand because this is the basis of our pleas. Give our land back. This is a peaceful, resistant forum. And we will not resort to violence. Government of that blinking day said, get off there, you know. Get off there. This is our land back. This is our land. Where else in the world do people get away with? kicking people off their own home, off their own land. Well, it happened in New Zealand. And I, uh, my way out to Totoko, eh? those words <clears throat> around like a child with an open mind. 
you know, I talk about being an optimist. Um, we'll come back to um, the things we do and, and um, the Māori economy. But I'll introduce you a little bit to uh, Ngāti Whātua. Ngā uri o Tupiriri. We uh, all can trace ourselves back to Tupiriri, who was, uh, lived in Tamaki in the 1700s. Um, so uri o Tupiriri, uh, Kahu Tōpunu o Tupiriri, the central isthmus. Our marae sits there, and you'll see it in that beautiful picture looking back towards us. Orake Marae, the centre of our, our uh, universe. We have a trust. Um, Renat de Blair, who I'm replacing today, he's on that trust board along with another eight of our whānau elected members. It was a PSGE, created nearly 10 years ago. I was talking to Audrey um, from Foundation North about that. Um, it's been just over 10 years, us as a PSGE. Under the trust board, we have two organisations, the Marae as well though, uh, three organisations who include that centre of our universe. Whairawa, Whairawa, go and make some money. Protect our assets, that's what they do. Commercial, uh, land mainly, we own a bunch of land uh, from that uh, terrible time, not so long ago, 1951, if you notice from that um, video, we had nothing. One acre, our urupa down at Okahu Bay, Okahu Matamoimoi, just below our um, current marae on top of the hill. So we had nothing. Tragedy. Our language was gone, our land was gone. Then we came through those resurgence, you know, and also resilience, the likes of Uncle Joe Hawke, 1978, got kicked off, Takaparafo forcibly removed after 507 days of occupation there. That was the turning point. That was the turning point. Uh, leap forward from there, not so long after that, but 91, sorry, we were given the land back, 1991. So that land that we'd fought for, the land that was going to be developed by um, uh, the Honourable uh, Prime Minister at the time, Robert Muldoon, um, they were going to develop that land. We would have lost it. They gave it back to us in 1991, and we straight away gave it back to the city of Auckland under the oldest reserves board in New Zealand. Oldest reserves board in 1991, so that's 30 odd years. That's, uh, we won't call it co-governance, because that's not a very good term anymore, but co-achievement, uh, co-nurturing, co-achievement. Um, I like the word achievement, I'll go back to that. So our trust under that five hour, five mile boards, commercial, Five Maya, I'm in the tribal development arm. <clears throat> and in that arm, um, I'm going to focus on our, our part of the Māori economy here. What do we do to help our whānau? And I'll come back to that in a little while. So, in our economy, the world, but also Aotearoa, and I listened to uh, Tama Potaka talk about some figures which I'll try and rattle off if I can remember them. But the rapid changes, and listening to that professional speaker before me, thank you for that, um, lining me up after him. Um, Jenny May, that's really nice of you. Um, so rapid changes, the way people talk, the way the Gen Xers look at things differently to us. I'm not going to send any emojis anymore because I'm speaking a different language. Um, our children, uh, even us now, um, and I won't say how old I am, but you heard I'm a koro, so I'm old enough that uh, we didn't even have computers when I was at school. Um, escalating health risks, challenges including mental well-being, mental health, we talk about mental well-being, mental health, those things have been around, but we never talked about them like we do now. Upsetting people by saying you have to work hard. Um, those things that, um, in my day as an electrician, you got your backside kicked, you swept the floor for weeks, and then you had to do studies and uh, learn all the stuff, and all of a sudden you're an electrician, you did the same thing to your apprentice. Um, access to homes, and I'll come back to that soon, health, opportunity, and also the climate issue that we have. What's climate adaptation gonna look like for us? The global challenges, ourselves, you know, war, chaos, where we sit in that global economy, they're all affecting us. But as Māori, as Ngāti Whātua, what can we do? And I've focused on this. We need to understand our whānau needs first and foremost. Uh, you think that's pretty easy, but even our whānau, um, we call ourselves whānau, we are uri or tupiriri, there's nearly 8,000 of us. So we are a little um, iwi, not all based in Tāmaki, but predominantly based in Tāmaki. This is our place. We aren't urban Māori. We are Māori in an urban context. And to tell a little bit of that story um, around us being in Tāmaki, we don't have anywhere else to go. Now, we're not just Ngāti Whātua. I'm also Ngāpui, I'm also Scottish, I'm also English. But as Ngāti Whātua, this is our place. Our whānau want to live on our papakāinga. They want to have homes on our papakāinga. They want a thriving, sustainable papakāinga. So we go to whole bunch of things that we'd like them to achieve and to soar and fly to the highest heights 
is very difficult if you haven't satisfied those, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, kai, a home. So we need to focus on those kinds of things. Ngāti Whātua, how do we invest in those areas to ensure our people, through that and other things we do, which I'll talk about soon, have the aspiration, are inspired by people just in front of them, or their nephew next to them, or their cousin who's going over um, overseas to be in sports, or to be a, a business leader like Renata Blair. Um, how do we inspire our people? Very difficult unless we get housing right. Housing, social determinants, so that's the role that I play, which is why I'm talking more about that than money. We look after our whānau from birth, i te whenua, ki te whenua, to death, in social areas, environmental, cultural, education, health. We employ about 130 people, 140 in my team actually, and then in the uh, trust office run by my wonderful cousin Lisa Davis. She's got another 60 odd in our financial arm. Um, they've got um, probably about another 60. But we focus on those social determinants and it's an investment we need to make. An investment in now and an investment in the future. Thinking about where we've come from, we've got high aspirations. One of the things I talk to our, my cousins about and uh, Marka's mum, our chief, Marama Royal, is we need to be resilient like uncle and uncles and aunties were, nannies, papas were. We need to ensure that our young ones coming through are resilient too. Because you get that old story, eh? Those uncles of ours, aunties of ours, nannies, papas that earned it, we grow it, next generation or so could blow it. We need to make sure we are part of the bigger picture, not just our houses are resilient, but we are, I'll call, it, call it this, I'm occupying other jurisdictions. And I'll come back to that for um, this sector, sport and recreation too, occupying those other spaces that we used to argue about, complain about. We can't just sit back and not occupy them if we want to be part of a better future for all of us. So I'm going to talk about some examples. Um, the housing one, I'll, I'll stick to that because I know it reasonably well. We build houses. We've got land in Tamaki, very expensive land. Very expensive to build houses right now, um, but we'll, I'll come up with some ways we've been able to achieve house ownership for some of our young first home buyers in Tamaki in 2024. Um, but one of the things we're doing also is getting our people ready, our young ones ready for the financial challenges, getting them financially literate. If they've left school, doesn't matter. We've entered into an arrangement with Banker to do some workshops around financial literacy getting our people thinking about money, changing their relationship with money in putia. So it's not just about spending it all the time. What else can I do with it? What does an investment look like? Um, what is an asset? What's a liability? So that financial li literacy is an investment that we're making in our economy that will contribute to the wider economy. The other thing we've done with our kaumatua, uh, Pākeke more than kaumatua, Pākeke probably 29 to 59, um, and also our young ones, Thinking about wills, so having a pilot scheme with the public trust. I, I surprised to learn that only, only about 50%, not surprised, the figure I think is inflated. 50% <clears throat> of Māori have a will or, or so on, or have protection for, um, for death. And uh, when I dug with um, the public trust, they said, oh, actually, that's, you know, they might have a trust. So the number's lower than they state in, in actual fact. And we're going to work on that. Um, work on what happens when I die. Uh, we call it life insurance, living insurance. You know, I've thought about it a little bit like a pyramid scheme. You know, the, the life insurers, excuse me, they rely on you to pull out. You know, you might break up from a partner, you might, uh, when you're older, you don't have as much disposable cash, stop paying. Ha ha, the insurance company wins. Why don't we guarantee, we keep paying that life insurance? Why don't my kids, their, their kids, so my grandkids, pay for that insurance. That first generation, boom, the money comes in, Tom's dead, Koro Tom's gone, we're now going to invest more of that money back in here for whatever the trust might say it might be, education and so on. Um, I spoke to a couple of insurance companies, they said there's nothing we can do about it. But people rely on not being communal, not working together, not trusting each other. So um, there's, there's a little scheme that I've been thinking about, it's not secret, obviously I've just told you all. Um, <laughs> but I think it's simple, if you trust your brothers, your sisters, and you want to work, that's, you know, you can't, if you, you know, even me at my age, I've been paying a certain amount a month, it'll go up over time, reasonably healthy person, but I reckon I'll spend $500,000 for a million dollar return. Even with the future value of money, that's a pretty good return. Uh, work it out, you, you guys who are really finance people, that's, that's probably my financial gem for the day. And it might not be accurate, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, yeah, access to home ownership. 
I'll just give you some pictures just to show you. That picture there is a young whānau in their early 30s. We have younger whānau who are going to move into their first house. So that's our Hawaiki Street up on our ridge line, uh, Kupe Street, beautiful views of the city. Um, you know, you, these people would not be able to buy those houses. I'll share some more stories about that um, or some more details around that soon. But I think it was 24 homes, different sizes, one bedroom, some two bedrooms, some four plus one, so you can have intergenerational koro nanny living with, with a whānau. Um, but a beautiful, beautiful project, uh, and I'll come into some details on how it worked for us. Ah, oh, there's the picture. You couldn't see the picture, I could. So that's, that's looking back, it's looking back down um, across to uh, Yarangi Toto. Um, but yeah, 24 houses uh, up, you know, design that's uh, terrace housing, land's expensive, trying to get as much bang for our buck. 24 homes instead of the, there weren't many there at the time when we took it down, but in the past when we did Kainga Tua Tahi, this Kainga Tua Rua, uh, we had, I think, 100, we turned, we, we turned it into 120 bedrooms from 30 bedrooms. Yeah, think of it that way. A and the same amount of land. This would be even more than that. That's what they look like done. They're not quite done. They're finished um, in December. Our whānau will start moving in. At least 20 of our whānau going in there, so partners and so on, are under 40, first home buyers. Now, that doesn't happen in Tāmaki and doesn't happen with Māori. So how do we enable that? This is the plan we went through. So in Ngāti Whātua, we own the land as a, as a trust. Our whānau won't own the land. That it's theirs, so they'll get a 150, I think we talked about, um, long-term lease to occupy that space, the house gets built on it. Uh, there's no developer's margin, uh, nice design, civil costs, all covered around about $7 million. Um, Grant Campbell, the CEO of our um, Whairawa commercial arm, tells me that we didn't pass on to our family members. Still, that's a hard ask for someone to buy on that piece of land at today's build costs. Build costs in Tāmaki are between 6000 and $7,000 per square metre. So these houses are not cheap, even though you're not buying the land. We're talking about, and I'm happy to share the figures, I think two bedrooms are around about $465,000, three bedroom, $900,000, the four bedroom, just over a million dollars. That's a house without the land. So these mortgages are still significant. The next line, shared equity. Our organisation will keep up to 25% equity in the house and the interest-free and the whānau members over time can buy that back. And that's not the bank, that's Ngāti Whātua uh, ourselves. Um, all the other stuff that saves money to keep the cost down. The banks, we had two banks come in, and I'll say their names, BNZ and Westpac, did a great job, hadn't dealt with us before. What's the challenge with the bank loaning money on this deal? The land, the land's not the equity, right? Normally the land goes up, not the house. So what did we have to do to ensure that they were happy with loaning on the house value alone? build quality and underwrite it. Build quality houses, very good quality houses. They said, yep, that's a million dollar house for sure, not a million dollar on um, valuation and, and a cheap house. So quality, um, underwrite the mortgages written there. Um, then we had funding from the government, funding that helped us with some of the infrastructure. Um, they came to the party to a degree. I think some of that seven million might have been MHUD, I think was, is what they call themselves. But uh, working together in this economy that's helping us to help Auckland, right? There's now 20 other families aren't looking for a house to rent or to live in. We are part of the solution for Tāmaki. And what's good for Ngāti Whātua in Tāmaki is good for Māori and Pacifica, it's good for Tāmaki and should be good for Aotearoa, then the globe. I'm going to move to a little bit broader things that we do. We, outside of our own houses, we are involved in advocacy, master planning on what we call our 700 acre block uh, te Fatu Toto, or Te Kauau. You heard that name, Te Kauau, this week? That's what we named our waka. Just got launched on Sunday. Marka was involved, I was too cold to go. Um, but it was magnificent. 20 plus years since our last waka, the millennium, Mahuhu Ki Te Rangi, Mahuhu O Te Rangi was launched. we now got Te Kauau, a magnificent um, symbol of resilience and resurgence. We're now on the, on the water again, on the Waitamata. These are important things for whānau. I talk about aspiration coming from Maslow's down here to aspiration. Seeing our waka on the, on the water with our young ones, some of them as uh, young as 14, uh, magnificent for us, magnificent for Māori, magnificent for Tāmaki and Aotearoa as well. But yeah, on our, we've got master planning for our, our whenua. Involvement in um, 
I'll call it climate um, kaupapa, bunch of them, on the land, in the water. So having an economy that thinks about just putia or thinks about development or investment is not the only thing. Us Māori think about those other things as well. We, on our whenua, when we gave it back, 1991, the whenua rangatira we call it, around about, in total, 110 hectares across that green bit to the top of the picture, that's um, Takapotafo, which is by the water. The other green bit on the other side is we call Pōrewa, Te Pōrewa, which is where the, um, I think it was uh, St. Helier's Pony Club was there. We got that back a little bit later, 2017. But those two bits of land, we've got ecological restoration projects that have been running for 20 plus years. We call it Kote Pukaki. No poisons, no sprays. Um, we grow native trees there. We have our own nursery we developed in conjunction with the Konehira. This, um, this reserve board is a co-investment, co-managed um, model. And so we've got a, um, on Pōrewa, so the bottom side of your picture, we've got a native bush nursery, tamaki uh, gene source, I think they call it. So tamaki um, source seeds and, and all the rako from here that can grow 500,000 native uh, plants per annum. And those plants for ecological restoration on our own whenua, but elsewhere. Māori economy is not just about puti, I've said that, it's about that, but the important thing for us is thought leadership. It's about other people. We're doing this on our whenua. And when we ask a developer or the kaunehira, when they ask us to do a CVA, cultural values assessment, we might say, hey, we do this. Why wouldn't you follow? We developed the Niwi management plan, and it's the oldest one, I think the last one's about 2018. We will do a review of that um, once the RMA reforms changed, and we've got a few position statements around climate, around mana o te wai, and around our restoration kaupapa on the back of what we've learnt. A lot of um, research projects on the whenua with um, some of the research, research people, Waipapa Toma today, the University of Auckland, AUT, um, beautiful projects. One of them is called the Living Laboratories. Living Laboratories on the whenua. We have Living Laboratories on the Moana, muscle growth or muscle restoration. Um, I think biodiversity checks um, on the whenua and in, in the Moana. So it's about us not living what we live, living by our values, kaitiakitanga, um, living by the values of kotahitanga, working together, living by the values of manamoto, haki, having independence. This is our land, we can do what we like but bringing other people along. So that advocacy is a beautiful thing. Master, pl master planning and then aspiration. Where, wh what are we looking at in the future? This picture looks beautiful to me. One of the other things that happened to us after, well, before losing all our land. 2010-11, they built a sewer right across the front of our Okahu Bay. And that sewer is actually why that piece of land's elevated on the road there. So that sewer still remains there. And that sewer was to take the, um, the gravity-fed uh, sewerage from as far away in this place in the, um, as the ridge here at um, Auckland Hospital. So right out onto our, our, our um, hunting grounds, our kai moana, and it was dreadful. It um, killed people, it, it changed our lives forever. So you think of that, eh? they put a sewerage pipe right in front of our, our, at the time we were down there, before we got kicked up, that was our marae, that was our uh, pataka, that was our kaimoana collecting, taken away from us. So I, I said about us not having any, anywhere else to go. My generation, the generation before me as well, probably many generations ahead will not be able to collect kaimoana out of their traditional kaimoana gathering spots. So that picture for me is taking that road and taking it around the back so we can have clear access to the moana again to the water, which may not be the same as what it was 100 years ago, may not be as clean, may not have the kaimawana, but symbolisation, and I know Maka's mum, Marama, um, loves this. This may not happen. That's, you know, it's taking tamaki drive and taking it for a little bit of a detour. Um, it still cuts us off too, you know, you can't, if you don't move the road somewhere else, the road's still going to be there. But what could enable is that te kauau, I mentioned, that beautiful waka, being able to go straight across into the moana and out onto the moana. So master planning is important, the environmental stuff, the aspirational stuff, but trying to return, revitalise is a hard word to, to think about. Um, but I also think about um, not going back to where we were, but getting back as far as possible to what is good. 
listening to the um, professional speaker before me, it was amazing. I had to write down a few notes about doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same result. That is magnificent. That is magnificent. Um, that's going to be something I'll use in the future. A couple of other beautiful pictures of, of our other developments, which will happen on Coupe Street, a whole lot of green, you know, um, some buildings that are designed around efficiency, efficiency de design and build and um, numbers of people we can house on the land, the shrinking amount of land that's available to us and others. Next slide, a little bit similar, but once again, around the environment, um, around combining development with what's good for the environment. Having our, our nursery around the corner helps us because we can just bring the trees from there, but having influence on tamaki, other parts of Aotearoa, um, and also sharing what we've learned openly. We have a rule. If it's good for us, it's good for everyone. It's, if it's so valuable, you shouldn't share it, you bloody better share it. All right, so if I was thinking about the Māori economy, what's important for Māori is important for everyone. If you learn some innovations, data, analytics, all that kind of stuff, share this stuff. Yeah, who are we competing with? Actually, we need to win in Aotearoa to be relevant in the future. And we need to work together to do that. The Māori economy summary for me, playing the long game, I've tried to use a little bit of sporting um, you know, analogies here. You know, strategic investments, diversification, diversification of uh, thought of our investments. It's hard for us at Ngāti Whātua. Our, tr our, our uncles and aunties, our nannies and papas, they were very smart. They prioritised whenua. And I'll tell you a little bit of story about our whenua. A lot of people don't know this. Our main asset is called Te Tōngaroa, down at Key Park by Spark, it's called Spark Store, Spark Arena. Around about 20 hectares of land. I think it was 1995, the Kone whoever it was at the time, said, hey, Ngāti Whātua, you guys can buy this for $40 million, knowing we had no money. Walked away and um, thought, oh, they, they won't be able to buy it. Uncle Joe and Uncle Hugh um, met a guy called Magellan, a developer. Hey, Magellan, how about you take this land Give us 40 million, you have no ground rents for 10 years, I might have been 15, 15 years, then you give the land back to us. That sounds like a great idea. Shook hands with him, went back to the Kone Hitter. Oh yeah, we got the money. Well actually, um, it's 80 million, we just had a valuation. And that's the mana of Uncle Joe and Uncle Hugh said to the Kone Hitter, no, we shook on this, here's the 40 million. That whenua, close to $700 million. So our largest piece of our uh, Balance sheet, largest piece of our um, net assets that Ngāti Whātua have. Not from our claim or settlement. We got $18 million in 2012. We took that $18 million and then took a loan of 110 and bought some land, commercial land, on the North Shore. Not for now, but for future generations. So uh, playing the long game, the land that we, we did there, 15 years. The whenua that we bought and on leased, 150 year, I forget the name, there's a technical term, but um, lease, prepaid lease. So we are now in the process of doing the same thing with a bit of land down at Orake. What, it's been in the media a little bit. They're finally going, don't sell him land, we don't sell land. Pre, prepaid lease, long term, because it's not about just us, it's about the future generations. So playing the long game, overcoming hurdles, you've, you've heard some of the hurdles that we've been through. We have them on the daily, you know, in recent times in court, fighting our other whānau, our whanonga from around the mutu, because the, um, the, uh, the government says, oh yeah, we've settled in Tamaki, but there's, a, there's a, um, a bit of land, a bit of public land, a school that's available, we'll give it to you as part of your settlement. Kaori, that bit of land is right in Ngāti Whātua's backyard. Here we go. Tikanga didn't work, off to court. We've been in court for years. A little bit quieter now. <laughs> we, um, we have this thing called Te Matatini Pōhiri, and that worked out pretty well for us. You know, we ended up... Um, Talking to Fananga from Tainui and others, leave it be. Uh, we had a settlement from um, Judge Palmer, Jeffrey Palmer's son, I think his name was um, Richard. Um, he said, hey, Ngāti Whātua have the right to their tikanga and their assertion that they are the tangata whenua of the central isthmus, te kahu tōpuni o tūpuriri. So resilience, the environmental revitalisation I talked about already, uh, passing on the baton, our young ones, our young people, um, having them look up to the likes, like I said, of someone a little bit older than them, not someone three generations older than them, around their ability to kōrero Māori, their ability to occupy those other spaces. We've got people now in the Kaunehira, 
We've got people on local board. We've got people advising the Prime Minister in Poneke. She's an amazing woman. You guys will know her. I, my predecessor, Rangi Māori Ehune. And you've got people like that coming from our iwi, but not just occupying their space and being there, taking probably a sacrifice to go and do that, away from her family, to do that leadership role so we can see here. That's a space we can occupy. She's done it, I can do it. And those of you who know her, young woman, amazing leader, um, and there's others, there's others. The winning culture, you know, the cultural revitalization that we've invested our own money, mana motahaki, uh, probably a couple million dollars a year we spend on teaching our people our culture, our kōrero, our hitoria, um, our waiata. Um, you know, I took over this role as from Rangi Maria, and that crazy person thought she, he could uh, follow that professional speaker, and then also Rangi Maria Hunia uh, as a CEO of a tribal development, um, and I didn't even speak to Reo Māori. That's the hardest thing I do. The hardest thing I do every week is to raise my competency in Te Reo Māori, and um, I love it. I'm uh, way behind where I should be. I've got a lot of things I have to do when people ask me to fill in for cousins who already had the reo. I miss out on like tonight going to te reo lessons because I've got other things to do. But that's the thing that I challenge myself the hardest to be like my younger cousins. Be like Rangi Māori, to have te reo Māori. One of the gems that did come from Tama Potaka, I was with Tama Potaka on this, this call this morning. He was having breakfast pōnaki. I couldn't make it because I was here at this beautiful event. Um, he talked about te reo, te tiriti, he's going to fight hard. You know, with all the issues that are um, facing the economy, New Zealand, he says, that's our superpower. You know, having te reo in New Zealand, especially as Māori, is a magnificent thing that he will not see in his watch drop. Last slide, and then I'll have time for some questions, I think. Yeah, lessons for the sport and rec um, sector, I think. For us, it's a holistic approach, occupying those other spaces that are adjacent to you. You know, and uh, Raylene's a very, very accomplished commercial operator. She's worked in sport for a long time, but having the likes of Jolie here, people like that, that you can learn from, that, that you can share in the organisations you have. I think a holistic approach talks about also, um, you know, what does climate adaptation look like? I was in a corridor with TAU, some of um, uh, the colleagues that I work with in some of the other areas of mahi I do talking about what is the adaptation plan for a couple of these stadiums. And I come out of it from nowhere. You know, I don't know much about stadiums. I know there's some on the hill, good idea, some not on the hill, bad idea. You know, Carlo Park would have been a nightmare in the floods. Um, but thinking about making room for nature, reminding people that's, you know, that's a valley. That's where water's going to end up if there's a lot of it. Also, the thing I came up with was how do you partner with your friends? In your sector, right, you might have competitors. But when they need you and you need them, what's good for you all is good for you all. And I talked about in the old days, when your, your field, which was muddy, got uh, rained off, the cone had to say, yep, you listen in the eight in the morning, cancel, you go, yes. But you got transferred to someone else. So you could still play your sport. Thinking about how do you share the assets, the limited assets we may have available, if we have weather events, if the resilience isn't there, how do we take down those competitive things and say, hey, yes, we will continue to have that um, concert, because you know, Western Springs, you might have lost your power, flooded out, but we've got another place available. What's the benefit for Tāmaki Makoto? The promoters will keep coming here. If we show resilience, um, show a little bit of give and take, tato tato, eh? You look after me, I might look after you. So uh, it's an approach that um, isn't hard, but uh, people struggle, struggle with it. Community-centric development, uh, you know, that's, that's something that we do. It's not just about our papakanga, but how do we contribute to the whole thing? When you think about uh, the mahi you do rec centres, we're thinking of building one. Um, and uh, once again, led by Maka's wahine, my mum, sorry, um, Marama, a rec centre down at Okahu with, in, in an Orake um, that will be for the public to use. Ngati Whātua led, Ngati Whātua predominantly investing in. We've got a long way down the design track and we've got a lot of community support. What is that going to look like? That's going to look like a magnificent Māori themed building with a whole bunch of reasons for people to come there. Uh, sustainable practices, talked about that and that idea of um, climate adaptation is probably the, the main point there. But youth engagement and leadership, not just, you know, when that um, professional speaker, I think it was Martin, sorry if I got your name wrong, talked about how many young ones are in here, there's not many. You know, you know when I say young ones, there's a lot of people younger than me, but I look around our room, rooms like this often and think, oh, we're trying to speak their language, we're trying to build for their future, where the hell are they? Why aren't they in the room? 
So make sure they're there. Make sure the young ones are there. In my team at Fine Meyer, my ELT is made up, me the oldest by a long way, a financial guy who's um, probably similar, and then we've got people, and two of them, GM people, in their 30s. And on our trust board, we just elected, Fano elected last year, the youngest ever trust board member, Wahine, under 30. So to be responsible at the top of that ladder for the decisions for now, the future for Ngāti Whātua. A young niece of mine, Roy Te Ua, um, the first youngest, or well, the youngest ever um, member. So don't, don't leave them out of your decision making, of your thinking, of your planning, because they are the future. Engage with them purposefully, let them lead, actually, uh, where they can and with support. I heard some things before from them that we need to learn, that mentoring is not just about one way, it's two-way mentoring. We can learn a lot from our young people. I'll end with this slide. It is really motato for us, a tato tamariki, our young people. Me ngā reenga, a muri ake nei, and the generations we will not meet. Kia ora tato, happy to have some questions. If you do have any questions, just chuck your hand up um, and I can bring a mic around. One thing that did kind of uh, pop into my mind, Tom, was a lot of the uh, kōrero over the last couple of days has been around technology mm. and the introduction, well not introduction, but AI and how quickly tech is moving yeah. and how Ngāti Whātua is engaging with tech. Mm -hmm. Um, and you talk about, you know, for the future, for the future generation. So how are you guys implementing tech? Amazing question. Thank you. And I should have brought it up. We, we need tech. We, not, we don't all live in Tamaki, right? So we've got whānau mm. who live over, overseas. And through COVID, we learned to use, you know, the online stuff, connecting with people. We teach our real lessons online using technology. We actually also, in our health area, we are working towards, and some programs under what, what's called an Apple Reggie program. And Apple don't talk about this. How do we invest in tech that to help us do things better, faster, uh, more efficiently? And this is outside of just normal general mahi. One of the things that I think about, um, and a couple of the gems from Tama, is around our population, in Auckland particularly, um, our population, Māori Pacifica, brown population, is going to be between 30 and 40% mm. of the working age people, because we are average 15 years younger than the general population. We already know they're alive. They're going to be the working people. What do we want them working in? We want them working in tech. And we need to be specific about that. We need people to see themselves in that, see leaders, um, people they can aspire to that are Māori Pacifica, that are brown, and they're successful in tech. So that's, um, I think, the aspirational thing. When we get to that, we have leaders making those sacrifices, doing something that's different to what others have done, but then standing up and telling people about it. Uh, tech is going to be a, um, it needs to be a purposeful uh, investment for New Zealand, the government, for the people who are now going to stay here. The young ones I talked about who've got houses now, they're not going to do an O. They might do an OE like we used to and come back. <laughs> Most of our people who get qualified are going to do an O. They're off. Those young ones, they're trapped. You know, they're coming home. You know, get them to have babies and they, they are trapped. But that's it. Us Māori who are in tech, likely to stay here because of that deep connection to whenua, deep connection to kaiao and place. So yeah, tech is certainly a big part of it. Uh, we need to partner with the big organisations in tech to create those futures, create those heroes. Uh, and that's a big thing that we're going to be working on. I spoke to MSD, um, the Regional Commissioner, um, Jules Lynch, this morning about exactly that. So I'm sorry I didn't bring it up, to be honest. Um, Tama Potaka talked about this. Our deficit between Māori and non-Māori in New Zealand in GDP is nearly $2 billion per annum. Ten, no, $2 billion per annum. We talk about the virgin Māori economy of um, $100 billion by 2030. If we get it right, we'll smoke that. You think about the, the GDP loss internally by not having Māori earning as much as the rest of the population, not having a Māori and or Pacifica, um, our brown people in those higher paid roles. It is hurting our GDP. 50% um, I've oh, got to have a look at this figure, excuse me. What did he say? Yeah. Yeah, our GDP, um, Māori contribute less than half of it. So less than half the GDP is generated by Māori. 
and our population is growing, mm -hmm. we get that right, our GDP problem goes away. Good point. Well, uh, brings me back to that point, what's good for Māori that you've been uh, pushing this morning. What's good for Māori is good for everyone, and it's not just about us, but it's about the future generations. And as far as your real journey goes, well, man, we're all on that journey, eh? Not doing enough as, as we'd like to be. Um, the best way that I know how uh, to say thank you for your time um, is tēnei, tēnei waiata, mohi o koe. He a ha te hau, he wa wa te hau, he wa wa ra mai, he tiu he ra ki na na i a mai te pu pu tara ki hi ki uta e ti ki na tu e o. Te kotu ko i a te po, te po fakairo kotu ki wai te mata i oku wai rangi e kokiri. Nō reira, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today. Um, and ai, mō tātou uh, for our generations to come. Nō reira, ngā mihi ki a koe. Ngā mihi. Thank you, Tanya.